Good, good evening to all. It's a pleasure to be able to welcome you in our panel uh, of this 15th uh, SIEF Congress titled Symmetrical and Experimental Ethnographies, the Dialectics of the Observer and the Observers. We would like to thank you, to thank you all uh, for your pres presence in, in this panel. <clears throat> Sorry, a special uh, uh, thanks go to the presenters uh, of, the, of the papers of the panel. Our names are Anastasios Panagiotopoulos, a senior researcher at Centro en Rede de Antropologia, uh, Portugal. Luis Muñoz Villalón, PhD student at the University of Seville. And Javier Jiménez Rollo, independent research uh, in Tijuana, Mexico. In Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, our broad interest as anthropologists converge precisely in symmetric and experimental ethnographies and because of this and for being a fundamental uh, preoccupation in, ten, in contemporary anthropology, uh, we, thought, we thought it would, it would be interesting to create an academic encounter such as that of today. Um, more concretely, we, we would like to principally explore the consequences symmetric and experimental ethnographies have in relation to the traditional distinction between observer and the observed, uh, as well as in relation to the use of ethnographies genres <clears throat> in the production of our text. How do ethnography and theory enter a dynamic dialogue between them, uh, wherein one may break or bend the rules of the other? This is one of the central questions we wish to broadly pose in this panel. We aim at questioning a rather taken for granted uh, premise of anthropological practice. That is, uh, theory should reflect and be generated by ethnographic facts. Uh, well, we do, uh, do not wish to argue, uh, argue that it should be uh, the other way around, namely uh, that ethnographic facts should emerge out, emerge out sorry, of the conceived uh, theoretical model. We neither find the programmatic empiricism of the uh, discipline without its problem. With us, we wish to stress the dialectical uh, re relationship between ethnography and theory, observers and observer, fact and interpretation. In addition, we wish to explore, we wish to explore the, method the methodological implications of such an approach and the possibilities uh, of both the ethnography subjects becoming symmetrically, symmetrically producer of theory and the researcher becoming in one way, in one way or another uh, an ethnographic source of information. To, en to engage uh, with all these, these broad themes, uh, we shall be hosting five presentations. Uh, we shall be commencing with the uh, ethnographies in Latin America, which place an emphasis in the production the, of local knowledge and the challenges they pose in anthropology. Uh, we, will, uh, we shall begin with the presentation of Chakat Ohani, titled uh, Speculative Relations in Lima, Encounter with the Limits of Fog Capture and Ethnography, followed by, uh, by the paper of Leif uh, Grunewald, uh, titled Multiplane Comparison a Conceptual Experience, Experience with IRL Ethnography, Paraguayan Chaco. Later on, we shall be traveling towards Europe, delving into various reflections on the relations between observer and observed. Uh, through the presentation by Luis Muñoz Villalón, titled Dilemmas of Radical Participation in Context of Spirituality, when total immersion obscures reflexivity but sheds light from experience. And Barbara Slapova, Spalova, sorry, Marek Liska and Boche Pelikan, I'm sorry, uh, titled Longing for the Participatory Church, Power and Helplessness in Participatory Design of Research. The two papers share a common interest in Catholic context. Fin finally, uh, uh, we shall be concluding <clears throat> the presentation with that of Alfonso Socrates Rigo, titled the, the Teachings of Homo Velamine. The, how their activist speaks about research, research and militancy. militancy. Uh, please, uh, please, each presentation should not exceed uh, 20 minutes uh, to keep the flow. We would su suggest uh, having only a few minutes after each presentation for more specific questions uh, concerning the ethnographic field. 
the um, comment, comment and questions of a larger theoretical and epistemological scope can be expressed uh, after the last presentation in which the debate will take place. So we hope that you all uh, find this panel interesting and productive. Uh, without further delay, I give the floor to Chaka Dohani with the paper title Speculative Relations in Lima, in Lima Encounter with the Limits, the Limits of Fog Capture and Ethnography. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if I can share again. Um, thanks to the organizers for putting together this panel. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of Manchester. Um, my presentation today draws on aspects of my fieldwork on fog capture and emergent attunements to fog um, in coastal Peru, um, mainly in the context of water infrastructure and fog oasis conservation. And although I do not deal explicitly to, with the question of observer on, and observed, I will use my ethnography um, to say something about ethnographic experimentation and symmetricity. Um, okay, so in coastal Peru and northern Chile, <clears throat> temperature inversions cause the regular appearance of thick ground touching clouds that almost never precipitate, but keep blowing inland over desert landscapes characterized by extreme aridity. Saturated with mist during the greater part of the year, these geographies host a variety of plants that capture the tiny water droplets suspended in the air, distributing them to their immediate surroundings in the form of fog drip. In Lima, civil society associations, NGOs, and residents on the urban periphery set out to mimic these techniques. By setting up large nets situated perpendicular to the direction of the wind, they want to provide an alternative water supply system in human settlements or asentamientos humanos, not yet reached by the infrastructure grid. As coastal winds blow the fog through the mesh, water trickles down into a gutter from where it is led into a storage tank, sometimes adding up to surprisingly large amounts of water. While early inquiries designated these peripheral settlements as epistemic objects to develop theories about self-help and auto-construction, my primary intention in this paper is to treat the urban periphery in Lima as in and of itself ontologically and epistemologically productive, as a site from where the city theorizes itself through material engagements with ground-touching clouds. This will allow me to bring into view a number of unanticipated things that fog capture did beyond the transformation of fog into water. And I will illustrate this through two examples of encounters with the limits of fog capture. Together, these examples demonstrate how, while often a disappointing alternative to state infrastructure, fog catchers or atrapanieblas have nonetheless served as speculative devices for eliciting a series of urban and ecological connections and disconnections for residents on the, on the city's peripheries. Against this backdrop, I will then conclude with some brief comments on the role of limitations in ethnographic practice and experimentation, asking what ethnography could take with it from how encounters with the limits of fog capture bring into view aspects of the social that are not immediately visible. So this is the Via Maria del Triunfo district in Southern Lima, where I conducted most of my field work in 2018 and 2019 among NGOs, civil society associations and residents interested in, interested in enrolling fog either in uh, small scale water supply systems or what, um, what they sometimes called infrastructures of fog oasis reforestation. And uh, this is just to illustrate some of the fog captures that I encountered during my field work. They look slightly different, but the overall principle is the same. Um, a large net that is uh, that sort of obstructs the, the, the air's capacity to hold um, airborne water droplets in atmospheric suspension, a bit like a gigantic sieve um, that filters the fog as it passes through it. Among my interlocutors in Lima and coastal Peru, fog catchers were often spoken of in, in a register similar to small device heuristics 
and microinfrastructures in other settings. Anthropologists have accounted for the heuristic outlook shared by many of these technologies. As Peter Redfield has argued, they respond to a common general problem, how to care for populations beyond the reach of state infrastructure. The response is minimalist and small scale, and it often rests on the promise of design to affect dramatic social change. In this connection, the ingenuity of the fog catchers was often considered to lie in how they tapped into a water source that otherwise went unnoticed, an extension of the ocean in atmospheric suspension. However, over my year of fieldwork in Lima and coastal Peru, I came across multiple instances where fog catchers were perceived as having failed to meet their designated ends as microinfrastructures. Rendering fog substantial was easier said than done, and the grip on the atmosphere afforded by these material assemblages often proved fleeting. Yet while exhibiting the fog catchers' limitations as microinfrastructures, these failures had likewise foregrounded a series of desirable and undesirable urban connections, including a space for envisaging the reconfiguration. The fog catchers had engendered a series of effects that went well beyond their initial purposes. Rosa and her son Alejandro had much to tell me about one such case. A couple of years earlier, a small local NGO's proposal to provide an alternative to the current dependency on private water supplier trucks had been welcomed with enthusiasm. Upon obtaining funding from a Dutch water foundation, the NGO took help from the residents to set up a large number of fog catchers above their settlement in the Via Maria del Triunfo district. The NGO director also spoke reassuringly about the possibility to potabilize the water, something that had ended with what Alejandro described in terms of failure, fracaso. It turned out that it turned out that the water contained all sorts of heavy metals, and filtering it went well beyond the residents' financial capacity. In addition, the water produced did not come anywhere near the volumes that had initially been promised by the NGO. Hence, while Rosa and her son often spoke smilingly about those days of collective, collective labor to install the fog catchers, they also expressed deep resentment. They felt betrayed by the NGO. Yet it also turned out that the fog catchers had brought a series of backgrounded relations to Alejandro's attention. Shortly upon installing the fog catchers, the white and green mesh had gradually blackened from capturing airborne pollutants. By obstructing fog's flow, the fog nets had translated aspects of the atmosphere into another smaller spatiotemporal scale, thus affecting a sudden exposure of hidden or withdrawn atmospheric entanglements. The airborne particles that were otherwise scattered in space and time and therefore difficult to see had suddenly become concentrated for Alejandro to apprehend more directly in the blackened mesh. As our conversation about the project went on, I would gradually notice how Alejandro tended to shift between the scale of the fog catchers and the scale of the city and Peru more broadly. Beyond atmospheric entanglements, what he described in terms of failure had likewise demonstrated to him how the NGO had taken advantage of what he thought of as the state's absence and inefficiency. As he explained to me, this absence manifested in a lack of legal criteria and capacity and consequently in the way the NGO director could leave their settlement uh, with his promises about potable water unfulfilled without facing any repercussions. Yet the relations he deemed desirable were not restricted to the state, for Alejandro also complained about the lack of what he called a social framework before and after the implementation. According to him, this was another reason why the project became unsustainable. In other words, he blamed the project's failure not on the fog catchers per se, but on a series of connections and disconnections that stretched well beyond them. As an effect of his encounter with an excess of undesirable relations between fog and airborne particles, Alejandro thus elicited also a lack of desirable relations. The former excess attuned him to a series of relations that he considered to be insufficiently thick, namely an infrastructure of care and legal criteria and capacity that would perhaps have been able to disentangle undesirable atmospheric entanglements. If the fog catchers had once appeared to be self-contained, they had now emerged as fundamentally relational. In order to live up to their promises, to their promises as a micro alternative to state infrastructure, they required certain relational reconfigur reconfigurations that stretched well beyond the fog catchers themselves, even to the state they were supposed to sort of stand in for. 
Now, this is not to say that Alejandro must have been oblivious of the relations that his encounter with the limits of fog capture had brought into visibility. By revealing their limitations as an alternative water supply system, the fog catchers rather oriented his attention to a set of relations that otherwise remained outside his immediate purview. As the fog catchers turned into something akin to what Timothy Choi has called apparatuses of atmospheric attunement, to describe devices used to concentrate elusive fungi, spores, and smells in laboratory settings. As Choi writes, quote, the humans and, our, and apparatuses in these atmospherically inclined mushroom experiments attune to and become subject to the qualities of relation between mushroom and air, end of quote. Similarly, by concentrating airborne particles and, and revealing their own limitations, the fall catchers brought certain atmospheric entanglements to the fore and with them a set of desirable relations that should have been there, but were not. Now to my second example. As it happens, the hills where, where Rosa and Alejandro live have for some emerged as fog oasis ecosystems, or lomas. These ecosystems are understood to be threatened by land trafficking and a growing number of squatter settlements around the city's peripheries, including the settlement where, where Rosa and Alejandro live. Having organized themselves in civil society associations, local conservationists therefore set out to protect these areas through reforestation activities and ecotourism walks. A conservationist who himself resided in the district, Oscar had long been spearheading one such initiative around Via Maria del Triunfo. Spending time with his association taught me that for him, the hills first emerged as fog oasis ecosystems, partly through his engagement with an NGO-led fog capture project many years earlier. His participation in the construction of an alternative water supply system for a number of settlements in the area had attuned him to ground touching clouds in ways that had radically changed his understanding of what fog could draw together and do. Over multiple conversations, Oscar recounted how he had been overwhelmed by the volumes of water captured. He told me, quote, we captured an incredible amount of water with the fog nets. In the beginning, we used channels made from these drainage tubes, you know, the ones that are about 10 centimeters wide, but soon these became overflown. They weren't enough, and so we had to replace the channels with a 90 centimeter wide piece of corrugated roofing. And this one was also filled up, end of quote. Making a sudden surprised expression while drawing lines between imaginary points in the air with his finger, Oscar explained how this dazzlement spurred him to gradually associate his observations of ebbing springs, his childhood encounters with trees in the area, and what he suspected to be traces of dried out rivers. By linking these to one another and consulting different sources to seek support for his theories, Oscar had gradually crafted a speculative narrative about the connections between the atmosphere, the now absent trees, and the underground, which together constituted the area as a particular kind of ecosystem that challenged narratives about Lima as a desert instead suggesting a gradual process of desertification instigated by the clearance of trees for agriculture and fuel in the expanding city. As he was always careful to point out, despite Lima being one of the world's largest desert cities, it potentially rains more in these coastal areas than in the interior of the country, in the Andes and the rainforest. But he would, he would clarify, this is precipitación oculta, hidden rain. What went missing were the natural fog catchers, the trees, to capture what he often referred to as horizontal rain, fog. The dried out rivers and ebbing springs depend on these connections, gradually cut off over the past centuries. Hence his and his conservation association's eagerness to reforest the hills so as to enhance the landscape's, landscape's capacity to produce fog drip, more effectively activate seeds and bulbs lying dormant beneath the soil, and recharge aquifers. At the time of the fog capture project's implementation, the area had not yet been reached by the water infrastructure grid. Members from a number of settlements had therefore gotten together to put pressure on the local municipality. Luckily, only a few years later, an extension of the grid was successfully underway, but this also meant that the fog catchers quickly fell out of use. Still, the fog catchers, fog catchers turned out to be particularly effective at being ineffective, so to speak in the sense that while falling out of use as an alternative water supply system, they nevertheless participated in the surprising elicitation 
of what was for Oscar a novel set of connections. By exceeding his expectations about the volumes of water suspended in the air, the fog catchers rendered hitherto backgrounded environmental relations speculatively conceivable, and they became the grounds for the formation of his conservation association. In the case of Alejandro and Oscar alike, the fog catchers turned from small device heuristics or micro infrastructures to speculative devices for imagining different urban political ecologies. Analogous to Matei Candea's framing of the ethnographic field as a device for redirecting the ethnographer's intentions and aims, in both my examples, fog catchers affected a lure that modified the course of events, even if in somewhat different ways. For Oscar, uh, sorry, for Alejandro, their efficiency in trapping water droplets in atmospheric suspension was also what made them inefficient as microinfrastructures, as rendering conceivable a set of atmospheric and urban connections and disconnections. Chaka, yeah, uh, you, you have three minutes, okay? I'm sorry. Great, perfect, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and for Oscar, their ability to capture more water than expected and thus to exceed the limits imposed by his expectations impelled speculation with regard to what folk could draw together and do. In both cases, folk catchers reoriented subjects' attention and raised novel questions. To paraphrase Tim Choi, these technologies of capture achieved not just an attainment of the object of the hunt, water, but likewise a steering of the chaser into new relations. Not merely a transformation of fog into water, these were thus mutual captures that, impact, that impacted also on the subjects involved. To conclude, I suggest that these encounters with the limits of fog capture and the mutual captures engendered are productive to think with for outlining an ethnographic approach that attends to limitations heuristically. This would be an approach that not only acknowledges our inevitable exclusions of certain elements from our, from our analysis, but taps into such limitations as the very condition for ethnographic experimentation set out to have the field lateral, laterally bear upon and bring into view the shortcomings of our own concepts and assumptions. As Matei Kandea, Rana Villerslev, and others have shown or argued in their work, limits and obstructions serve to bring into view aspects of the social and aspects of our own descriptive apparatuses that do not reveal themselves unprovoked, very much like the fog catchers that turn from micro infrastructures to speculative devices for eliciting backgrounded urban and ecological relations. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Chakat, for your presentation. It's really interesting. And the next one, the, the next presentation is, uh, sorry, is the presentation of Leaf. Leaf, it's okay. The yeah, Leaf. Okay. It works. <laughs> okay. Live Grunewald from the University Federal de Paraná. Uh, with the name of multiplying comparison, a conceptual experience with IRL ethnography. Paraguay and Shaco. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's all the time. Okay, thank you, Luis. Thank you, Anastasios. Thank you, everybody, for like, for being here today. Uh, as for many things, I would like to deep heartedly thank you all for the muchly appreciated opportunity of presenting today a type of slapdashly structured process of intellectual deliberation put together in order to speculate within the scope of two partially connected program domains. By one side, one specified by certain recent writing on the anthropological notion of comparison the other designated by some ethnographic material from an Amerindian collective I thought I knew quite well, IRL people, a Zamukulan speaking group from Paraguay and Chaco. As such, the general scope and bent of my presentation is to engage into a talk on, an, on a type of indigenous twist on an anthropological concept of comparison. Among the different ways of situating this paper, one of them could be suggesting 
that its main theme is positioned within the scope of Matei Candeus, critical reassessment of conceptual issues at the center of any form of anthropological comparison, but that, raise, but that it raises questions from the comparison itself between the way we, social anthropologists, translate native discourses into the terms of this discipline's conceptual framework and an IRL mode of comparison, which presumes the differentiation between different subjects and the kinds of bodies they have to experience the world as an effectual multiplicity. Based on my field work at Tiogai village in the right bank of the upper Paraguay river, I will describe cases of comparison across different sociological contexts, concentrating on the IRL notion of Akanheim and the sets of transformations it enacts. I argue that while a, an Euro-American mode of comparison proceeds by comparing different types of cultural representations of a single world grasped as the virtual focus of social anthropologists, different conceptual versions. Through the idea of Akanheim, IRL people put into comparison different types of bodies and peoples so that the comparative relationship itself plays an essential role both in the constitution of entities and the structure of IRL lived the world, giving shape to everyday practices. In this respect, I suggest ethnographically that IRL ontology is inherently comparative in such a way that the contrast between two ontologically different entities is not an obstacle to comparison, but a precondition for establishing relationships between diverse types of bodies. Before fully exploring these arguments, let us consider some facts of IRL Live the World. In October 2012, during part of my field work in the right bank of the Upper Paraguay River, I spent most part of my days hanging with Kuisi and Kikoma, an old couple of shamans collecting their stories and impressions of the changes that had occurred over the course of their lives since the contact with the Kohono white people and answering their numerous questions about myself, my family, and the place where I came from. One hot afternoon in Tiogai, I was sitting by a tree at their house's domestic patio, smoking cigarettes and chatting with Pebby, one of Kikome's son, a man who was about 45 years old and who also happened to be by that time the current leader of the village. As we are sitting drinking terere and blathering on about a recent fishing festival celebrated with a lot of pomp by people in the Brazilian town of Porto Murtinho, the conversation suddenly turned to a long recollection of leaders from the past and the outcomes of transformations that occurred as IRL people left the Salesian mission of Puerto Maria Auxiliadora and started living in the region down the river, closer to towns and to white people. According to these stories about past styles of leadership from the experience of first contact with white people onwards, the new courses of action that IRL people living in the Upper Paraguay River area engaged with different outsiders were mediated by the existence of new forces such as money and diseases. The same narratives I've heard from Kikoma's extended team offered a brief sight of a system of relating through which leaders from the past engaged in relations with different types of outsiders and entailed nurturing and cons conservation of good relations with co-residents and its transformation. Pebby told me that leaders from the past felt intense dislike for wars and could even kill people from their own group to avoid having to lead people in warfare. Playing the double role of moral agencies and political figureheads who led the way of people from their village, these leaders in general were told to be expected to be trustworthy and hardworking 
titular heads prone to forming groups and keeping them together through the coordination of collective activities and the giving of opinions on group issues and mediating relations with different types of outsiders. Nevertheless, leaders from the past were also described in a humorous manner as unfortunate hunters, constantly being described in a dual position of mediators of relations, both with, with co-resident insiders and with enemies and potential affines coming from outside. Leaders from the past were characterized as beings who never had the time to hunt, so that people from a village often felt obliged to support them with honey, the leg of a wild pig, or a piece of, a, of the back rib of an eater. It's worth mentioning that this was narrated by Tebi and his wife Ahote in stark contrast to an image of IRL people's contemporary lived world made distinctive by the idea that relationships, both with the inside and the outside, were mediated by the existence of new classes of disease, forms of wealth, and outsiders that didn't exist before. Pebby Pebby told me the following, now in IOTEL, to make his point, and here I'm quoting him. It feels like we have come into collision. Money didn't exist in our world previously. Things got intermingled and the intermingling led to change. See, I'm telling you, everything has changed. Mom and dad always say, if our grandmothers and grandfathers were living here in this world, close to the river, they would not trade their own moral in the forest for anything. They always say that things were a lot better in the past. There was a lot of warfare, warfare with people from other local groups, but at the same time, now we have a lot of conflict with hunters and land buyers. In the old days, when our people lived in the forest, there was, there was no diseases. Our bodies were different. People could die attacked by a jaguar or beaten by a snake, but nobody would ever die from a cough, fever, pneumonia, cancer. Life was easier with that kind of body. The Kohono, white people, started intruding on our territory and everything became worse. Now we are fragile, owners of fragile and frightened bodies, end of quotation. When explaining these multiple processes of transformation made possible through different forms of relations with different types of people, extended to a notion of body and to the way both a leader and people from the village relate to different types of outsiders, that is seemed to me to be examining and starkly contrasting two dissimilar lived worlds and conditions of being to establish dissimilarities between them. The image of this evaluation of two different state of affairs by determining their relevant characteristics to be contrasted and by designating how each set of circumstances of each lived world are different to the other was evoked by Pebby by the idea of Akanheim. At the time, I took the notion of Akanheim to be something like an IRL version of what Peter Gall made reference to as history is stating that it corresponds to the narrative of all create of the creation of contemporary kinship and the source of native people's response to the new situations, as if the idea of Akanheim corresponded to a response to the disjuncture between modes of relating that appear in distinct forms constitutive of two different types of bodies and modes of relatedness that could be understood as historical transformations. It was later made explicit to me that the notion of a Kahai was equally summoned up in other contexts as well. I was told of two other usages of a Kahai. One of them referred to the relationship between a body and its image, like a shadow, a, phot a photography, uh, a drawing, and the other made reference to the differentiation between mythical times and contemporary life on the Paraguay River. Often I was given examples to help me see that the idea of a Kahn might mean as if the inside of the historical aspect of this notion was brought to light by others, as if 
Each supplementary context of this notion revealed its further implications, but the implications itself only were made by their attachment. In any case, one of the most powerful of these examples came in one early morning from Pebby's nine years old daughter in response to my complaints regarding her constant acts of asking for crayons and blank pages from my few journals. At one time, she was sitting at Kikoma's doorstep, keeping herself busy making different drawings with the paper and the crayons she had previously got from my stuff. She would later come to my tent with one of these drawings she had just made. At first glance, I could see on this first drawing a huge man inside a tiny house and not enthusiastically asked her what she had drawn. She said with a laugh, you. As I couldn't catch any possible likeness at first sight, I ventured that it might be either because she was teasing me or because of what was happening in the past few days in which I was spending most part of the day laying in my tent recovering from a severe infection in my intestines. I was curious and wanted to know more about the drawing, she said. It doesn't need to be identical to you. It's like you, a kind. But here in the paper, you know, when you are out in the sun and you can see your shadow, it's you there, but on the floor, they are a kind to each other. Or on the photographs you take of us, it is us there, but living on your camera, end of quotation. As I try to read some understanding of this, a problem surfaced. How did the first image of a Kahn as a plural model existence and as the comparison of different kinds of existence by the perception of existential, existential variations connect to the conception of a Kahn as history and as the reaction to the disconnection between modes of relating of different types of bodies that could be understood as historical transformations? It seems to me it amounts to say that both one usage of the idea of a Kanhai and the other application of this comparative device demonstrated that neither of these different modes of ex existence are not inherent to existence in itself, but come into view as situated between different types of bodies and states of living. One conclusion of this paper, therefore, is to shift attention to the fact that while the anthropological notion of comparison is generally limit, limited to the set of resemblances that constitutes the lowest common multiple of societies, as Gilles da Salmon stated, the IRL idea of a Kahn presupposes difference and transformation as conditions to connect different types of subjects. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm here open to questions and to clarify some points so that that might be a little shady yet. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> can we um, hear to, Lu her to Luis, listen to Luis? Uh, yes, I'm going to say that thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And I start now, or, or we, we wait to the question for the, for the last presentation, no? I don't know if you have a question about the ethnographic field, some mm. detail or something. No, 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 I have no question, eh? sorry. I, I put my knee because <laughs> I, I am the next, so sorry. So uh, uh, we will uh, listen to, to Luis, ready? Okay. Yeah. So Luis Munoz Villalón, uh, uh, with the paper, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, dilemmas of radical participation in context of uh, spirituality when total immersion obscures uh, obscure reflexivity but sheds light uh, from experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, I'm going to try 
to put the uh, PowerPoint in the, in the in Zoom. Uh, okay. I need to open first my my presentation, no? and then share we with, with us. No? Uh, Imola, sorry. Uh, yeah. How how can I share my presentation? I you can see the uh, green share screen button. Uh, yes. And if you press that, then share. you should be able to choose from uh, 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 from your presentation. You have to first have your presentation open in order yes. to have that as an option. I have I have uh, I have opened it and now I'm trying to when I click in share screen this is a, they say who can share uh, every participant and yes. um, uh, don't click uh, no, okay. don't click on the okay. little yeah, arrow yeah, but okay, click okay, on sorry. the big okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay I was <laughs> I was clicking in the in the corner sorry no worries. Great. Now, huh? Yeah, we can see it and you can start the presentation okay. and then. Sorry, I, I'm trying to put in here. Okay. Great. Okay. We see your present presenter mode. Yes. Perfect. Uh, no? It's okay. Did you see did you see my presentation now, everybody? Or Yes, yeah. we see it okay. in the presenter mode. Okay, if that's okay much. with everyone. Okay. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis, and I am a PhD student uh, at the University of Sevilla. At first, I would like to thank the International Society for Technology and Folklore for, for organizing this congress and allowing us to discuss these issues always necessary in our discipline. I would like also like to thank the University of Helsinki and the other institution for co coordinating this congress. And in particular, to um, thank you to my two colleagues, Anastasia and Javier, for organizing the panel. Um, okay, the context of the context of my investigation. Uh, to begin, uh, I would like to contextualize my research. My thesis began at the same time as, uh, as the research project of which I am a member. In fact, I decided uh, what will become the doctoral thesis that I am now organizing under the interests and concerns uh, of this project. The three organizers of this panel, uh, we are members of that project in addition to Alfonso Socrates, who, who is the last speaker. Uh, in this project, uh, we regular we regularly discuss uh, many questions about the limits and possibilities of ethnography, a subject that has always attracted me in my short research career. This past year, for example, we organized an individual seminar in which we present our progress, our experiment, and uh, our doubts. It's, uh, it's from, from mine, which I titled Transitando los vericuetos de la fe, I think it's more or less like walking around the different ways to go to the faith, uh, from which I have extracted some of the reflection that I read today. Focusing on my thesis, uh, I began with the subject of the spiritual seekers. Also, at the beginning, I had in mind the practice associated with the new age and new spirituality, but above all, it was methodological concerns that motivated my research. As I said, the, these concerns are in the, inserted in those of the project of symmetrical and collaborative ethnography, highlighting this starting point that I will discuss later. Okay. This is the, okay. Okay. Uh, taking the other seriously. Also, this premise has already been widely discussed, and one on the other hand seems obvious. In ethnographic practice, is not so obvious. We often tend to overinterpret 
to let ourselves be carried away, uh, away by a non-fifth authority to ignore the discourse of our interlocutor. Using them at our uh, whim and interest. For this reason, and also it's, it's a part of the ethnography DNA, I try to always keep this premise in mind. Uh, relational with methodology, uh, radical participation is, as I understand, uh, an unavoidable way to get the most of, of the methodological proposal described by Holbrad and Pedersen. I am not saying that is the only way, but at least we should embody, feel from within the practice that we study, because in the in that way we work of conceptualization say wall seems to be an, an aseptic and distant task, or one that is alien to, to our being. Moreover, from this participation being affected as proposed by Fabrizada, uh, we will manage to question our ontological assumption as well as uh, be aware of our limitations and possibilities with and um, from our body. I'm going to share. Okay. Under this framework of theoretical and methodological concerns, I began to search through the circuits of practice associated with the holistic milieu that brings together all kinds of practice whether new age, new shamanism, esoteric, oriental spirituality, etc. In the meantime, while, while I was attending course, conference, various sessions, and all kind of practice that I found through the labyrinthine world of spirituality and therapeutic efforts, a friend recommended me to attend a Catholic spirituality center. With some su suspicion, due to my Catholic past, which I detest at a very young age, I decided to go and see what exactly the central group was. The emerging nature of ethnography with the visit to a Catholic Jesuit center ended up leading to autoethnography. In this center, which attracted my attention because it gave me it gave way to other types of spiritual practice, not Catholics, such as a meditation, silent retreats, mindfulness, focusing. I end up getting involved in a Catholic practice. In this center, many of the prejudices, both social and academic, which are still in form in relation to the Catholic religion and disbelievers and practitioners, were disarmed. And it was also at this center that I was able to verify the warnings about the supposed ontologies I spoke about early in the wake of a Holbrad and Pedersen. The model of Catholic practice in which I had been educated since I was born literally resembles to that of this type of Ignatian spirituality. The body, the sense, perception were ideas that were worked on daily. The relationship with God was built up in a much more independent and subjective way than I had been able to learn in my childhood. Um, Next Uh, yeah, and this time I start to my journeys of the spirit of God. Within this center and framed in the Ignatian spirituality, I start the journeys of the spirit of God. The journey of the spirit of God are in action spirituality, spiritual exercise since San Ignatius himself falls out according to a new change in 19 annotation that they could be done by anyone. Uh, the process consists in four journeys and a fifth that will correspond to the complete experience of the, uh, this exercise and could be done in a, personal, in a personalized way, way. The journey constitutes a process that has, that has as its purpose that the person experiences God and can find him in a daily life. As Carl Rahner said, God can and wants to deal directly with us, with his creature. The human being can personally experience that. Uh, the process can be done in group or individual. Each journey is designed to be done from October to June uh, with a weekly meeting, uh, meeting and accompanied by a person who will indicate the mode and order. It's a Ignatian spirituality concept. Uh, <laughs> I am not time. 
I need to go fast. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. The very important part for me today is this. Uh, I started in October of 2018. In the previous interview to start the journey, both my guide and the one in charge of coordinating the entrance new practitioners explained to me that are two fundamental steps for the initiation to the experience of God in the Ignatian, in the Ignatian exercise. Uh, the first is that the creator communicates with his creatures and he takes the, the initiative. And the second, that the person be able to grasp it. My guide spoke to me about the freedom and the human being to accept it, even though there are people with fear, with close spirituality, who are afraid to receive it. That's the project one can speak with the other, God, who is the one who's challenging us. It is not as speaking with other self during prayer, but we need that moment of intimacy. So that is God who communicates to us. This lead, this lead me to wonder how to open up this spiritual side, spiritual side. Since then, and with a communication to Radhika, uh, to with a commitment to radical participation, leaving my belief or disbelief in suspense, I keep a diary of my steps along this journey. I have a lot of ethnographic material which, tra uh, which transform and destroy or reconstruct concepts that try to address this ontological prevalence, using for this purpose the methodological framework proposed, like I told, the from Hobra and Pennison and which, as Vernaka indicates, it constitutes a possible methodological framework, guidelines from transforming the experience of alterity, which arise during field studies, people do and say things that the scholar deems incomprehensible into theoretical re reflection. I conceive my method of participation as an attempt to overcome the old, meth old models of aims and methodological agnosticism the result of the secular origin of the anthropology of religion. With, with scientific fundamentalism, secularism came to stay, even in positions of secular neutrality that continue to prevent a full appreciation of the inner experience and motivation of religious people. Mm. We seem to be able to free ourselves from this tension between observation and participation, between reason and emotion between intellect and effect, where opposites tend to compromise as a project of knowledge that remains anchored in Cartesian dwellings. These dwellings associate mind observation with a reflective moment and body participation with expedition immersion. Therefore, the question is to be aware that a particular ontology is underlying every theory and methodology. From this consideration, Fionnabo will propose an embodied approach to religion, trying to avoid this dualistic vision, interrupting the spiritual dimension. Along the same lines as Nike, Knife, and Van Hooter, Bowie criticized methodological agnosticism, which also is represent an overcoming of methodological aims. Continues to maintain insuperable boundaries for the researcher and, this, and his knowledge his knowledge project. These methodologies continue to be reductionist since they do not allow going beyond the limits imposed by the predominant academic conviction or by fears of, prof of professional and personal discredit. I myself have suffered when I had to share my methodological concerns and my position in the field this tension between hiding the experience as a good secular science or revealing it as a good reflective researcher. Uh, Anna Wallstein, in the, cost, in the context of a ethnography with Rastafarian rituals, reflects on these issues and says, when I begin to accept that outcomes of my action and intention toward normally unsense force and powers have consequence in the material world, I have probably, at least for most of my colleagues in anthropology, crossed over. This type of situation which are quite frequent, make necessary proposals such as symmetrical ethnography, which refuse anthropological discourse any advantage. 
and Nora Fish, in which taking the other seriously does not materialize in complex and suspension of the disbelief of a permanent methodological real concession, sign, since in this way we deny their potential. Nor would we now to beat on an interruption of judgment, something similar to what Holbrook and Pedersen proposed with the suspension of ontological assumption, but rather that, in test, instead of raking ontological question, we open our gates, the stabilize our third times, allowing ourselves to be absorbed by the wall of the other. When I began to attend the journeys, I not only accept to be affected, like Fabre Sada said, but I, com I commit myself by le letting myself be affected, trying to enter a, war a world not in a provisional, controlled way, but giving the possibility that, the, that this, this world could reveal itself beyond the mere concession as a methodological reality. Therefore, I propose to leave behind this, this, this embodied approach that transcends the rationality and intellectualist notion of ethnography. Uh, committing to others that include our own void experience. To convey in writing the multiple level of which the intersubjective and embodied nature of the ethnography encounters and knowledge are construed. The purpose of this kind of embodied ethnography is neither as a pretext nor as an ultimate goal to become a native, since a radicalization of participation does not necessarily lead to an egalitarian fiction. According to Emily Pierini, what distinguishes ethnographic knowledge is illuminating the process through which theories, notions, and categories are articulated and lived through, firstly by participant and then by the researcher. That is my intention to be able to incorporate this form of communication into my baggage, transforming us during the ethnography experience and modif modifying the way we think about ethnography itself. To do so, we will have to take the same ontological risk as those with whom we participate. Something similar to that what Kahn once proposed in his fieldwork as a beginner boxer, he stated that this render implies a total commitment, the suspension of prejudice, the relevance of everything, the identification and the risk of being hurt. It implies ontological displacement of our being in the world. Excuse and me, is, Luis. Yes, uh, is the time? You, you have three three minutes more. Okay, okay? perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And if spiritual knowledge is learned mainly through practical experience, we should carry out a process of training, of reeducation of our perception and ethnographic sensitive that will enable us in this task. Uh, okay. In my ethnography, this process of learning to experience the presence of God is essential. A way of being and being in the field that incorporates corporal and spiritual techniques to my methodological baggage. Achieving other somatic models of, of attention, I try to carry out a daily practice making for it the exercise proposed in the journeys, the body, the sense, the silence, the breathing, all the tools, the means which we have to train weekly in order to be able to listen to God, to notice this, his presence. This discernment, the motion, this, the desolation of the Ignatian categories that I have been incorporating in my being. Also, I felt many times, I am mistaken, waking my strength or my efforts, but with some sometimes give rewards that, from a more distant classic and ethnography, I would not have been able to feel. Thank you very much. Good. And now they have it. Okay, okay thank you, Luis. Uh, have you any question? I would like to ask a short question. Okay. Just to, um, thank you, Luis, for the presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, that, um, uh, in a way, I'm not sure, but that's what I understood, that um, the comparison, uh, the Ignatian exercise and the group makes, uh, is between a non-spiritual self, and uh, implicitly, and the spiritual mm -hmm. one, 
the one the self that finds God in everyday exercises. Uh, the comparison of the group is made between a secular scientific world, non-spiritual world, or do they also compare themselves with conventional Catholicism as well? Okay, no, no, the context, my practice in the journeys is in a Catholic uh, thinking and people, Catholic people. And the way we work the spirituality is uh, inside of this Catholic uh, you know, theology. But the difference here is that in uh, San Ignacio de Loyola, with his uh, spiritual exercise, work the relationship with God in a different way. Uh, this this uh, San Ignacio uh, uh, wrote this exercise in the time of Reforma and Contra Reforma. I don't know in English. In this yes, period. Reformation. Reformation and counter, uh, <laughs> counter, so, counter yes. In this time, uh, he he had problem with the Catholic institution because he tried to broke the the medi mediator, the mediums. Uh, I don't know the yes. the, the, author uh, the authority of the medium with that. So and now this kind of practice fix in the in a context of new spirituality, but with the <laughs> The exception that is a old, a really old uh, practice, 500 years or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, one more question. No? So, um, uh, now, uh, I'm sorry, Barbara Spalova, Marek Liska, and Bostek uh, Pelikan, I'm sorry. Uh, will present their paper. Uh, mm, 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 sorry, uh, longing for the participatory church power and helplessness in participatory design of research. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for having us. Uh, we are. So we will speak about uh, the research, ongoing research in Czech Republic, and we will stay in Catholic uh, field. Um, we will speak a lot about the participation on different levels in our project and our approaches. And uh, our presentation will be will have uh, four parts um, because actually the emphasis is about our shifting positions between the researchers and church members in this applied project. But first we will speak about the participation in the project design, then about the participation in the church and then about this shifting um, position. So I will present the participation in the project. Uh, it's important to say that it's, it's an applied research project. We are now in the third year of, of it. And the name of it is Society in the Church in the Process of Restitution of Church Properties. Uh, it's an ongoing process in Chen Czech Republic, which uh, should lead to the separation of the church and society and uh, state. <laughs> and uh, so the subtitle is Support of Participation. Um, the participation was a kind of uh, our reply to some demands of the grant scheme. Uh, so there was this requirement of the scientific innovation, which we uh, replied by participative research design, which is not very usual uh, in Czech Republic. And uh, because it's an applied research project, so we had to have an applied goal. And uh, it was actually this, uh, that we want to support the participation in the church and of the church in the society. So what, what, what does it mean to participation research design in this project? Uh, so obviously it's quite usual in ethnographic uh, uh, researches that um, we approached our research consultants as experts on, on the research topics. And we had a structure of the interview, but we were very open. We are very open to change it according to the topics that people want to speak about. And the most tricky uh, moment of this design is this 18 planet participative workshops which we had to somehow describe in the in the project proposal, but actually it's really very open to the demands and needs of the people from the field. So, so we have to uh, constantly negotiate it with the grant provider, uh, how we will do these uh, participative workshops. 
And so about the applied goals, um, uh, we want to support the participation inside the church. It's a kind of political agenda um, of us as church members, but also as the researchers, because uh, uh, we did some previous research about the uh, relationships between light and clergy in the Catholic Church in Czech Republic. And so we want to support by this project a kind of... Uh, um, the spirituality of collaboration uh, in the uh, in the Catholic Church and about the participation of the church within the society I will quote from the project proposal it, so it was quite <laughs> big words it will help to overcome the mentality of the defensive walls of the church against society and the social stereotype of the uselessness of churches and I will pass now the words to uh, Vojta he will present the participation in the church how what, what do we support uh, during the process, during the yeah, research? Yeah, okay. So, Bara, thank you for giving me the floor. I'm going to talk about the part of the research dealing with the participation within the church. So, first of all, I provide you briefly with some context to understand better the story I'll talk about later. The Diocese of Pilsen is the second youngest of eight Czech dioceses. It lies in the southwestern part of the Republic, uh, close to the German border. Uh, to get at least a vague picture of the role that the church plays there, just around 1% of people living there regularly attend Sunday Masses. Uh, compared to the other seven dioceses, this one is quite exceptional in several aspects related to participation. There is an effort of the curia and especially the bishop himself to support the autonomy of parishes and participation within them in both economic and pastoral terms. Uh, there is also an emphasis on the participation of parishes, including laity, in the formulation of the vision of the diocese's transformation. Uh, the level of participation in church life is seen as one of the criteria of being a so-called real parish, which the future of the diocese should be based on. Uh, however, this process of empowerment can be exclusive as well, especially for those who do not comply with the official discourse. Uh, particip uh, participation within the parish of, or the diocese is also influenced by the different circumstances each parish face. There are significant discrepancies between those around the city of Pilsen and other larger towns and those situated on the periphery or in the regions where there was a German population expelled after World War II. Uh, the dynamics of participation within the diocese can gain different forms. On the one hand, the bishop is sometimes seen as someone who overuses managerial methods or as someone who intervenes in the situational and local context of parishes. On the other hand, sometimes parishes themselves see their autonomy as a burden and they are trying to shift responsibilities to the upper levels of hierarchy. Yeah, so next slide. Uh, the story of the parish we would like to look into in more detail takes place in Hepp, a city close to the German border. Uh, it is one of the parishes which fulfill the diocese's criteria of being a real parish. Its identity can be described as open, anti-clerical or ecumenical. Uh, the priest actively endorses the participation of the laity. Many things are discussed within the parish community, including economic strategies or content, uh, content of Sunday's sermons. Uh, several parishioners, including the priest, are active in civic life. In the picture, you can see one example of such activity, the memorial of COVID-19 victims that appeared this spring on the Heps main square. Uh, one of the reasons we have chosen this parish is that it is where the environmental agenda I'm mainly interested in gradually became important. The process of negotiation, what to do with the restituted fields, forests and meadows, and how to deal with the imperative to be their good steward became creatively implemented into existing discourses and practices. Uh, at first, the care for the restituted property had not been seen as something important for the parish identity and practice. Here you can see the quotation of the priest Petr Hruška expressing his attitude that the roles of priests and landscape manager are in conflict. Yeah, next. 
Uh, as you can see, however, gradually the perspective has changed and the environmental agenda started to become incorporated into their open, civic-oriented and participative mindset. Uh, here you can read our field notes from one of the project workshops where representatives of the diocese were present too. You can see econ uh, economistic framing of the landscape management and a lack of its spiritual or environmental framing. Uh, afterwards, however, the parish asked us to participate in their debate about what to do with the restituted property. We organized a discussion on encyclical Laudato Si and its relation to the parish practices. And in the coming months, the environmental agenda became embraced by both the priests and parishioners. They decided to invest part of their income into eco-projects and they started with the help of the botanist who is part of our research team to think about renewing in an environmentally sensitive way the surroundings of the dilapidated pilgrimage church and they offered the place to the outdoor kindergarten. So in the process of our research, we were switching between several roles of those who are try to understand the dynamics of the parish, those who support the process of nego uh, negotiation within the parish, or those who try to bring new options, what to do and how to reflect on the issues. Okay, so I pass the word to Marek. Thanks. Uh, hi, hope you can hear me. Yes. So, we uh, just said Dalshi. So, what's what is important to note here is that the Czech Catholic Church operates in somehow very secular society. The Czech state was founded on the opposition towards the Habsburg, therefore Catholic monarchy, and the anti-church narrative was further strengthened during the communist era and its uh, persecution of the churches. However, after the end of socialism in 1989, the Catholics had a strong position as they were seen as moral winners of the former regime, but um, the church did not really answer those callings from society and decided instead to go the way of inner consolidation and reinstitutionalization, offering service for the remaining few believers rather than for the society. And so many benefits of somehow underground church works during socialism were lost even, or even persecuted by the church office, uh, officials. And today only the charities and schools offer some service for the non-Christian society. Um, next. Um, but it was the schools we were particularly interested in our project, as it is also interested uh, the bishop. So we agreed that we will conduct participatory research on the schools from the person diocese. And the main research question was, what does the church identity or Christian identity mean for the schools? Um, the church schools in the diocese were founded mainly after 1989 as uh, somehow grassroots initiatives, often by non-members of the church, but uh, aiming to religious, spiritual, moral, or some so on values in education, uh, in opposition to still very communistic school environment and methods. And they were founded with church or bishop allowance rather than with the super support of any kind, either financial or any other. And the diocese was not uh, previously interested in much involvement in the curriculum or anything. And there is also a minority of Christians in those schools. Next. In the research, we've seen that the actors of the schools play with uh, secular religious binary. Some of them wishes for the school to be more secular. Some of them wanted to be more relig religious. All of them were appreciating church schools as some sort of alternative to the state, state schools. They see the benefits of more family-like environment and so on. And especially teachers and directors would speak about presenting Christianity in the civil way, free from ceremonialism, 
more in the form of Christian values, manifested in more respectful relationship towards students and towards each other in the sense of uh, community. And this translation has, however, also some limitations. We also observe uh, the conflict in conceptualizing religious studies as uh, Christian ethics for non-believers by grammar school priest teacher, which uh, bothers some of the students, of course, and they said, why not call it Christian religion when in fact it is the Christian religion. Yeah, thank you. So I will close with our um, so reflection of our shifting positions of the researchers and also church members. So we three are actually the church members also, uh, mm -hmm. other mem members of the uh, research team are not, but yeah, it was not planned, but it is like that. Uh, so uh, going back to the HEP case, uh, we can see that we went to the field as uh, researchers, as uh, scientists. Um, so with, with the position or the perspective of landscape ecology, environmental anthropology, but we also um, were uh, aware that it's uh, important. It, it, it was also for us personally important to link this agenda, this ecological agenda, to some theological discourse. And so we we could show some ways how to do it, but of course we needed a powerful theological partner, which we found in, in the local priest. And uh, it helped then to shift to the position that we've been somehow promoting the green church inside the church. And then we brought back the HEP green efforts back to the scientific audience as an exam of good practice. And so we could empower the green church initiatives uh, through, through this scientific um, discourse. Uh, when we saw the other case uh, uh, from the fields so, of uh, the case of the church schools and our engagement there, uh, it's quite different because uh, we came uh, uh, also to the field as uh, from some expert positions. So we've been um, involved to uh, search for actors' interpretations of Christian character of the schools. And then we found that actually in the field, no, it was not really our uh our, our perspective first, but in the field, um, uh, the actor situated the interpretation within the secular religious binary. And they often um, uh, use a interesting kind of translations across the secular religious border. And uh, in this position, we felt like obliged as anthropologists to um, uh, bring this um, respect to, to, to diversity and multivocality um, and to uh, bring this per perspective to the church school owners uh, and to say them that they need to respect the secular sensibilities of the majority of church school actors, so namely the freedom of belief. And it was, so we, we've been in the position of of researchers, scientists, but also as of church members and also of uh, citizens. But we didn't really find the, um, the or until now, we <laughs> didn't really find a, a powerful uh, partner in the church for this, uh, for this claim to respect the secular sensibilities in the church schools. So we will see how it will uh, develop. But... Um, it was an important moment for, for, for us in the reflection um, of the process of the participation uh, in this project, because actually um, we've been uh, thinking about uh, if this secular religious binary, which we are uh, um, presenting to the church owners in our um, report, uh, is something what is really what is coming really from the field, or uh, if it is something what is coming from the anthropology? Uh, and um, uh, I put here the quotation from the Joel Robbins' last book when he rephrased the in, in German theologian in Golf uh, and he says about this secular religious binary that uh, it's it is creating space for itself by disciplining the border um, 
reach of religion and how the religion sometimes push you, pushes back against this disciplinary effort. So it's about this very horizontal um, perspective, uh, which according to Dalford and to, to Robbins too, is something what is inherent to a secular uh, anthropology. And um, it was um, for us a kind of, a kind of alert uh, to think about uh, how much we are uh, we are really um, sticking to this secular thought, and uh, if it is something what stop us to uh, to change the perspective to more vertical one, which would uh, uh, emphasize the divine worldly structuration, and which would maybe uh, give us the possibility of uh, transformative dialogue with the uh, theological thought. So it just... Excuse question. me, yeah. Barbara, uh, you have uh, three minutes. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's great. Sorry. So this is one point of uh, of the presentation. Uh, how, how is it uh, with the secular religious binary? Should we really... Uh, or is it so important for, for anthropology to stay in this horizontal uh, perspective? And the second one is about the criteria of um, decision-making or um, especially in applied, uh, in applied research, it was, uh, it was so uh, important to see during our reflexive moments during the, the project that uh, if we have to decide what we will do next in the, in the project, we are only uh, we have the only possibility to uh, base the, the, the decision on our personal ethical integrity. Yeah, so some sometimes it was more important for us to decide it as church members or as researchers or as citizens. It was somehow <laughs> uh, uh, difficult to. Um, to find the position, but uh, it uh, what was uh, striking that it was in sharp contrast with uh, the solid criterion of discernment, discernment which uh, was at many times presented by the bishop. Um, he has this his Jesuit tantum quantum. He says that he he do or we do so do we like bishopric. We do things to the extent that they lead to the to an encounter with the living God. And um, uh, this is, so the next uh, question to, to the audience here, if we need uh, some more solid, more anthropological maybe uh, criteria to, um, uh, to uh, decide or to justify our decisions, then we have now in, in the reflexive, um, practice of uh, of the so research process uh, or is it just um, impossible that we <laughs> that we will find something more more solid so thank you uh, thank you a lot for attention and we are um, uh, very much interested in the discussion so, uh, thank you very much uh, have you uh, any question? So uh, now uh, we will listen to uh, Alfonso Alfonso Socrates uh, with the paper. Hello, with the paper, uh, the teachings uh, of Homo Velamine, uh, how their activism speaks about research and militancy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone. I try to share the screen. Yeah. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So thanks to all for being here. I hope I'm able to bring something interesting from my own ethnography that is inevitably experimental. First of all, I consider this presentation an experiment too and invite everyone to take part in an imaginative exercise. We don't know Homo velamine, and we will not get to know too much about them here. We are only going to approach some experiments done by them. What we should imagine is that they are an anthropologist, 
and they do an ethnography of the lay people from Spain. I apologize in advance because both. As you can see, I need to read my talk and because it's possible that some aspects of the Spanish topics could be difficult to translate, meanings of contextual or political culture, but I try to do my best. We could think Homo Velamine works against ordinary reality in the Spaniard's public square. In that place, Homo Velamine grants an irreverent anthropology where sympathy makes a continuum with antipathy. Like paragnographers, they use this continuum in order to alter the ordinary reality of our naturalized relationship with ideas, symbols, objects, etc. In their words, Homo Velamine takes thoughts to, to its own contradiction and observes who chooses to laugh or, on the contrary, to hate while embracing his dogma. At the end, they distort conventions. Of course, there is something here from ethnomethodology, but also from Dadaism or Situationism. They don't call the electron experiments, they call them ultra-rational acts. In the photo, we can see the first time they decide to put their body into action in 2015, when they began doing performance. Ultra-rationalism is their own philosophy and the reason they consider are significant behind human behavior. Ultra-rational is not irrational, but it is stronger than reason. In the end, we will have a clearer picture of this. They use social networks to study participants, their behaviors, tastes, contradictions, what they hate, love, worry about, etc. From the full spectrum of types of groups varying from right to the left wing, feminists, animalists, fascists, etc. From here, they extract a first ultra rational element to experiment with. Okay. Let's see some other examples. In December 2015 elections broke another wing from the Spanish traditional conservative right-wing party, Partido Popular or PP. First, first wing was in 2011 when it was the Indignados movement. That was a paradox and motive behind the foundation of Homo Velamine. But in 2015, PP did an election campaign for young people using a hipster image, an image associated with vegan, healthy, or ecological values. This is contradictory with traditional Pepe voters. Homo Velamine gave body to those hipsters, and they went to Pepe's headquarters to celebrate the victory. They were carrying banners with absurd and humorous slogans, but this did not stop the press from taking notice. They were on the front page of the French online newspaper Liberation, but on, not only there. Also, several journalists from Spanish press put his attention on them. They were prepared and they treat the press really seriously. In previous events, they had the control of communicative facts. And sometimes the experiment ends up in a fan thing or Facebook group where they have some control over spectators. But this time, a Spanish newspaper echoed this news from liberation and revealed his true identity. They never did that. They always communicate the, their acts, intensifying the ironic, absurd, or contradictory element. As they say, you know when and how the event begins, but never when and how it ends. In the society of the spectacle, the speech control is in the hands of the media. But Tomo Velamine comes from another society that the research has called the society of micro spectacle. On the contrary of what Guy Debord thought, that is, breaking the undirectionality of media will be the revolution of people against the spectacle, ultra-rational research confirmed by internet, where people have power to communicate like Debord dreamed, they actually use this to reinforce the spectacle for their own participation. This is an example from Facebook group of Pepe voters. From Homo Velamine, these are an examples of Posart. Dadaist made the composition without any necessity of expertise, taste, or genius. Dadaist used this art for criticism against power. 
But today, Posar is used to support political parties or particular ideologies. These images are only shared by people who have positive feelings towards it. Each element reinforces these feelings and orientate to an ideological beauty. This ideological beauty express a reticular fragment of the social and political scenario, what is constantly crossed by Homo velamine, a similar exercise to the one Viveiros de Castro assigns to the shaman in perspectivism, but in this case, they call it irony. They also went to support the radical left-wing party, missing this support with the Catholic values. They were impersonate as priests and nuns that support communist ideas. Something contradictory, at least in the Spanish context, where the church was an ally of the dictatorship. Some people welcomed this support, referring the transversality of the political movement, but also they were insulted. On this occasion, the press also took notice about them. Okay, new missing topic in Spain, Catalonian independence. In 2019, there was a pro-independence demonstration in Madrid. Homo Velamine was there with a big Spanish flag to support the independence. There are at least two readings here. They are Spaniards who sympathize with the pro-independence cause, but also Spaniards who don't want Catalans in Spain. And again, they appear on The Guardian and in the Spanish TV. The last one, the Women's Day demonstration, in 2018, generated a great deal of controversy among political parties in Spain. The feminist movement had become very strong and all political parties seemed to support the demonstration. On the one hand, feminists want to be transversal, for feminism to reach the world of society. But at the same time, some feminist movements try to link with other political insights against monarchy, against capitalism, etc. On the other hand, the right wing wanted to link itself to feminism because many people, many people support it, but they didn't want to support other left wing cows. What Tomo Bellamine uh, came up with on this occasion was a GN Spanish flag that say long life feminist Spain. But traditionally in Spain, the left rejects the national flag and they support the Republican ones. This generates a lot of confusion among the demonstrators. Some began to applaud, but others began to boo and shoot against the flag. Several protesters even climbed up to the flag to remove it and punched one of the members of Homo Velamine. Why does this happen? Some members consider, consider that people on the political left today behave more dogmatically than people on the right. And it's true that the action directed at the left have had more violent consequences. Even today, they are condemned by the Spanish Supreme Court for another act that we have no time here to explain. But could it be that they act differently on one side and on the other? I think so. Precisely because the members of Homo Velamine ascribe to the political left from the perspective, the absurdity of the right is explicit. There, they only reinforce that perceived absurdity. On the other hand, when it comes to the left, they often introduce an element from outside to generate contradiction. Here, it is clear that they are addressing a left-wing audience. For this audience, as for them, the absurdity of the right is evident. But in order to see their own, that is, ironically, Homo Velamine provokes them with these just oppositions. This speaks me about methodological relativism and moral relativism, which the separation, I think, is absurd. It only works in theory, but never in practice. Inspired by, by Homo Velamine, I consider irony could be a tool to deal with this absurdity in our ethnographic practice. It is possible that anthropologists concerned with experience, subjectivity, or the phenomenological content had led us to take this matter too seriously. Anthropologists might have contributed to overlapping 
other important aspects of human beings, their ironic capacity and their absurd condition. For Albert Camus, absurdity emanates from the class between subjective expectations and, and social reality. For Thomas Nagel, it emanates from the class within ourselves, between the sharingness with which we take life and the awareness of, in, of its randomness. In other words, between our commitments and our contingency. But for, for both, the absurd is inescapable. Contrary to them, I think that absurdity can be avoided. Anthropologists know the mechanism that societies have to avoid it, their rites and myths. But in this sense, it has happened to anthropologists as it has happened to Homo velamine with the left. So anthropologists have used irony in scientific laboratories, but only there. From Homo, from Homo velamine's view, to avoid absurdity is to fall into dogma. It's not about getting to the logos. Homo velamine consider that reason can be one of the most powerful myths. But the unconsciousness of absurdity often leads us to divide the world into allies and enemies. Irony helps us to cross these boundaries. But irony does not resolve the absurdity. We all return to our life full of mundane commitments. Here, then, we could situate ultra reason. Ultra rationalism wells where reason cannot reach. It is the non reason by which we remain committed, even in irony or contradiction. Anthropologists like Nagel Rapport or Roland State use irony in a unique sense, the cognitive defleshment by which we could appreciate our own contingency. An alienatum from ourselves. But Homo velamine distinguishes four forms of irony, each of which set out different ways of relating to realities, including ourselves, that is, with our existential absurdity. Pre irony is a natural form of relativity that ignores the absurdity. With the awareness of absurd, irony will be the form of relationship where contingency elements, where the contingency elements encompasses those of seriousness. Post irony will be the rever relationship. As in the case of Camus, awareness of the absurd leads us to seek higher purpose to engage with human dignity, justice, equality, etc. Here, seriousness encompasses contingency. However, Homo velamine considers meta-irony meta -irony, the ideal kind of relationship. Meta-irony invites us to take neither contingency nor commitment too seriously. As Nagel says, says, if a sense of the absurd is a way of perceiving our true situation, and if there is no reason to believe that anything matters, then that doesn't matter either. And we can approach or our absurd lives with irony instead of heroism or despair. Although theoretical ultra-rationalism ultra strives to make irony independent of humor, what I, he, what I have seen in practice is that humor is a fundamental tool to make it possible. Humor helps us to be reflective, as opposed to, to militant seriousness. To conclude, as this is a work in progress, I still wonder whether it will be breaking the rules to do metaironic ethnography. Perhaps it will be the reverse strategy of the anthropologist's suspension of this belief. Anthropologists will, te will test their own beliefs about the other by making the other confront them. Maybe this is not very serious. Maybe it is a bit antipathic, but it will be more honest. That's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, do you have any question? I no. think we should get on with the discussion because we don't have a lot of time. OK. So, uh, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Five. Five. 
Ε, η Μολά. <laughs> Save us. Are you, are you there, Μολά? I think that uh, it will not stop. Uh, This is what I wanted to make sure that it will not stop. So if you don't mind, because we kind of had an idea of a discussion by myself and then debate. And if we only have five minutes, this is impossible. This is impossible. Uh, so if you don't have any problem to stay on, uh, a bit more than the official time, Hi, I finally managed to... Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, the screen was frozen and I couldn't click on, on mute. Ah, okay, so sorry worry. about that. But don't you worry. can take uh, your time and you can stay as long as you want. The Zoom uh, will stay open. <laughs> sorry about that. This no, don't worry, don't much. worry. <laughs> Thank you for the, for, uh, for the information. For, yeah, no for worries. Me. Glad I could convey it. Okay, so you can carry on talking as long as you like. <laughs> Thanks, thanks. No worries. So, okay, so we are cool, more or less. Um, well, I, I, I could, I would very much like to go into uh, in the details of the um, individual presentations, um, but I think I'm going to briefly try and make some uh, common like uh, common comments uh, and in the meantime then in the discussion I can also um, make some question more more particular but I found it interesting that um, uh, the panel was actually much more solid than I thought. Uh, I think <laughs> I really, I really have the feeling, which you can only have it after the presentations, uh, that they really glued together. Uh, at least, uh, of course, uh, all have their individuality and uh, special, uh, interesting ethnographic points. Uh, but I, I kind of saw some uh, themes quite common to all the presentations. Um, for example, one like large theme, the one of transformations, um, the comparison and the participatory uh, element, um, even the mimicry as more uh, than anyone Socrates uh, uh, kind of exposed. Um, and uh, uh, I also, the fog, the fog metaphor as well, for me, worked quite well for all the presentations, <laughs> the limits and the fog, um, uh, because um, it's, it's a misty, like, as if we were living at some peculiar times where uh, both are, um, la let's say, the ethnographic subjects uh, and ourselves live in. Um, and uh, although we make comparisons with the past, for example, um, uh, Leif's, I think, presentation uh, made that explicit. Um, but always trying to understand the present. And I think uh, concluding with uh, um, the home of Elamine uh, ethnography uh, kind of uh, wraps up uh, all this fog <laughs> uh, because we continually make uh, these comparisons with the past as if the present Um, we understand transformations, uh, however these are bodily or cultural. Uh, we understand transformation between the past and the present. Uh, but uh, perhaps, and I think this might be shared not only among the presentations, but also between us as ethnographers and uh, our interlocutors, 
uh, also a kind of uh, big question mark of comparison between the present and the future. There's there's a feeling that you know um, strict frontiers are being questioned. For example, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, ethnography between secularism and uh, theology and uh, anthropology. Um, uh, the limits are are there, but you know the future is a bit uncertain. Uh, we we kind of all feel that uh, things are changing, but we don't know exactly towards where. And uh, I think Homo Velamine is, as a conclusion, it was a good conclusion because uh, it kind of gave a critical note, but on an ironic tone, uh, which exactly also presents this as an ethnographic question that uh, we make these comparisons, the past, the present, um, and we want to stay critical to to these concepts and categories, but this doesn't really mean we 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 know exactly <laughs> where where we are heading. Or, and uh, until then, we can even be ironic to our own selves. Um, so these are some just very brief comments I I had to make, um, and we can go on with the discussion. So, okay, we can maybe start the discussion. Yes. Um, I was wondering during this um, um, Homo Velamine presentation uh, and about the conclusion that irony can be something that we can learn from it and to introduce it uh, to our um, descriptions. Um, what, what, what will it mean in the terms of power? Is it empowering of the scientific research or, or, or not really? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, in my opinion, have a relationship with power, but uh, the, the homo blamine itself has uh, a continuity critical voice uh, because elitism or that kind of things, but uh, I think it depends the where is your failure and and what are your subjects of study. But I appreciate a symptom of the epoch, maybe that we treat with society like it was a childhood, you know and. And that, for me, is 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 the real elitism, no? Like we tried, like a father with with our or like a mother, the same way uh, with our subject of study, no? Um, not always, of course, but uh, several times, even when overall, when when our field work is in um, in a conflict contest or no it's like a padrinazgo i don't know the anthropologist is there to help that people and and that is a, a perspective for anthropologists uh, or for anthropology that separate the field or the the objectives of the field and the objectives of the anthropology, no? And uh, at the end, there is a moral commitment, I think, but is to reveal that absurdity, no? That is everywhere, that we live in contradiction every time. And maybe if we need to, to look for some moral commitment, that is, no? The, to reveal that, yeah, I I know that is um, seem like I don't know enlightenment maybe the to to secularism or have a relationship with that, 
but I don't know. I, my main argument, I think, is is that no, the the society with which we work are adults uh, equally ourselves. No, mm -hmm. I don't know if I respond your worry. Uh, no, it's it's not a worry. Just a just a question. How do you imagine it? And uh, maybe you, if you can ex uh, explain more about this um, um, uh, discernment of the aim of the field and of the aim of the anthropology, um, I was not sure about it. Uh, yeah, in the that uh, this discussion, I think is in the last number of the How, the Journal of Ethnographical. You know the review about moral, uh, and I don't know the name, but one of the researchers, um, uh, their arguments are uh, the the towels, you know, or the no the outside, the academy is outside from the worries of the society because our worries are let's say more permanent or universal no i i think for example uh, the behavior of hannah arendt in the court with the jewis uh, his concern is not the contextual moment that if a if she judge uh, the Nazis or not, she she was there thinking in another thing, no? That is the the social phenomenon or something like that. Sorry, my English, but okay. uh, I I at the moment <laughs> I defend that perspective of the the academia. Mm -hmm. No, that. I confess that some some worries of my field are the same than mine. Mm -hmm. But but uh, these uh, don't focus my research. No, but this don't guide or orientate my research because it's not always. I I try to to mm -hmm. be ironic. With the irony of my of homo velamine, no, I I try to to look uh, uh, from the outside of homo velamine to homo velamine, uh, despite our uh, our share our uh, worry shared between they and and me. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because my English is shortly. <laughs> it's not about the English. Yeah. yeah. Maybe this is something what is different in applied research that. Uh, you feel much more involved in the actual uh, conflict and actual decision making. Uh, you are at one time observing and and one time somehow influencing, and it's. Um, I think it's a feature of all the researches, but in the applied research, it's something what is planned, what is uh, <laughs> what you have to count with uh, in the beginning. So. So it may be, maybe this is the the feature which uh, of the applied research which uh, uh, brings a lot of this um, reflexive uh, questions and uh, a lot of um, a quest for some criteria how to how to decide um, so what to do, <laughs> what to support, mm. what, to, what is good and what is bad. Yeah, in order to apply, also it depends of your team table no if you apply for for one concrete context but i think hannah Aren in the court was applying for the humanity no in 
another ten table that is in other terms. I think it's not. I don't know if the difference is apply anthropology or theoretical anthropology, because theoretical anthropology I think I apply for humanity or apply for mm. your knowledge about everything. I don't know. Can I make a question? If if you don't continue with the or or we can go back to the but I'm I just but I'm going to get out a bit of this specific uh, debate. It was about a question. It can apply both to Luis uh, and uh, Marek's Barbara's and Wojciech's presentation. Uh, in terms of, of, of a new Catholic effort, um, if you see from yourselves or the ethnographic interlocutors, uh, as, uh, if you see it as an eth your ethnographic context, if you see it as an effort uh, to, of, as Luis mentioned at some point, of uh, a kind of reformation of Catholicism, uh, and how could you compare it with um, with Protestantism? Uh, the parallel of Protest. I mean, more specifically, this anti-clerical, let's say, modernizing modernizing effort of of religion to deal with um, everyday life, with uh, being more participatory and not so hierarchical. Uh, to deal with modern problems, as uh, the Czech Republic uh, context uh, demonstrated, for example, uh, environmental issues, uh, or in Louis' case, um, a very personal experience of God, which doesn't need mediators like uh, you know clerical authority. Um, and this th this question is a bit more general, but. I kind of implied the same question to Luis when I said, how do his interlocutors um, see, uh, the, not the enemy, but the opposite? How, how do they compare themselves to whom? Only to secular ideology or also to other religious groups? I don't know if I was understood. Yes. Uh, for, the, for the last question, in my example, for the, uh, sometimes we discuss about the different politics in the Catholic uh, world. And um, for example, now with the Francisco uh, Pope, who is a Jesuit, sometimes there are different positions about how the church uh, has to do about some different global concerns, for example, uh, I'm thinking about the position of the woman in the church, about the opening of some rituals for the, uh, for the woman who could someday, who knows, to, to open this category. No? Um, in, my, in, this, in my field, in my, my, my mates in these journeys, of the spirit of God, they are different position. Is they are not. <laughs> we are in this Ignatian, Ignatian, Ignatian. I don't know. Is Ignatian spirituality? Is this no standard? No. Okay. Ignatian. Ignatian. Okay. In this Ignatian spirituality, they are different. Uh, they are like um, I understand that, like a uh, one way to think about this question, but then. In my in my own group, there are people who is more near to this um, conservador, uh, kind of conservative, conservative position, and then there are other people who, for example, like me, has been maybe I don't know 15, 20 years uh, doing things outside of the church, and now the church of the Child-like institution, and now they they 
def defend this position like you know is inside of the, this group mm, we represent different uh, position about different uh, concerns for example the, the feminist but the other question more like the the relationship with god if Mm, if the if we need some uh, someone to mm, to, uh, to to manage this this is an event or not I don't know it's like um, there are not like one big position about something or there are not uh, one way of thinking about uh, the Catholic question in this in action spirituality I think it's like a really different um, abanico. <laughs> it's like too many different points in this in this kind of context. I know of the Catholic context that everybody is more restricted about uh, the possibility to defend some uh, alternative uh, ideas. I'm sorry for my English, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I would completely agree that uh, it's really hard to answer this question for Catholic context as whole because, uh, yeah, there are some people who see in the contemporary, so Francisco period, uh, a kind of uh, uh, reformation period and a kind of progressive reformation period. And there are others who see it as, um, as a decay or as, a, yeah. Uh, so, but the, to the question of the denominational comparison or denominational cooperation, maybe. Um, so we, I had another research, which is actually uh, planned as uh, comparison between a mainline Protestant church in Czech Republic and Slovakia and uh, Catholics and Baptists. And uh, so, yes, actually the Protestant churches in Central Europe are for example, in the field of uh, of ecology, uh, more more active or have more experiences, um, but they are also quite so much smaller players, much smaller actors than so in Czech Republic, than the Catholic Church. So, uh, in the cities as HEP or the places uh, where the Catholics are um, are open. Um, there, there is a very usual, very common uh, ecumenical cooperation because the Christian are su such a small minority in the Czech Republic that they don't have to uh, play at the borders between the churches. It's like has no uh, no sense. Uh, I, I take advantage uh, of the fact that uh, that you talk about Protestantism <clears throat> to say that every time I listen to Luis, I find more parallels, um, more uh, shared um, points between Ignatian spirituality and Pentecostalism. I think uh, some interesting points in common, like uh, discernment, the practice, the learning, I think so. Do you, do you read uh, uh, some uh, academic uh, write yes. about Pentecostalism? In fact, uh, I think Tanya Lurman, who works uh, about uh, the prayers and the like a uh, um, neuroanthropological approach sometimes. Uh, yeah, she works with um, Pentecostalists, but sometimes she refers the excess the Ignatian exercise uh, because in these uh, books is like a I don't know like a, I, I don't know like a other I don't. Uh, <laughs> a way to work with the um, Kaskasian prior. I don't know exactly uh, for where she take this uh, concept. Kaskas. Kaf, 
Cajatacartian. I don't know. It's difficult in, in Spanish. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a something about when you pray and you work with your my imagination and you visualize the conversation, for example, or you imagine you imagine yourself in the words, in the holy words, uh, when. I don't know, for example, the Gospels, St. Mark. No? And you have to make like an effort to translate yourself in this uh, picture. And, you know, you have to feel uh, the sigh of the God and then work with these uh, kind of feelings. Yes, uh, I think sometimes uh, it's really different to the old-fashioned way of Catholic. Another question or if not we can think about finish the I would like uh, to ask a question for uh, Leif. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, you were talking about uh, this transformation, these okay. transformations that um, lead people to comparison. Yeah. And um if I understood well, the, the like the core argument is that the comparison, the difference uh, in com the comparative approach, um, is because transformation is uh, linked and entangled to transformations in the body. Yeah, not only on the body, but on the outset where people live. Like, for example, transformation on landscape, transformation in the modes of living, transformation on okay. body. Yeah. This is what I, w I wanted to kind of understand, that uh, the ethnographic, uh, the, I mean, the indigenous understanding is that uh, uh, all, all these are coterminous, mm -hmm. uh, all these transformation happen together, or that uh, something transforms the rest. Like states of living, for example, transform bodies, oh, okay. mm -hmm. or well, bodies transform states of living, or maybe in the the comparison is between the past that bodies made state of living, and now states of living are making bodies. Yeah, or, I think I think it goes. I think it's a, a very good question. I think it goes both ways. Like by one side, like modes of living. Bodies are are collectively built, and they are called and like they are built by acts of nurture and like acts of living together and eating together and living in the same village, eating like proper food and stuff. This this make bodies. So of course, like changes in states of living, they they implicate in change of bodies. But also change of body when, for example, when someone goes living in the town. Go. Uh, people say he he's gonna be his pro like the person's probably gonna become something else. Like the and the transformation, it's it's explicitly explicitly on the body. Um, I'll give you another example. For example, if someone is eating like I don't know maybe a tortoise, um, they have like a feast and eating a tortoise. If you eat too much, or if you do not wash your hands and stuff, and, and you know, this wash your hands and stuff, the, these people, they lived with missionaries for like the past 50 years. And the missionaries back, the Catholic missionaries just left them maybe 30 years ago. So most, most part of their like living with white, close white people uh, from the first contact in the 50s onwards, like most part of it was with Catholic missionaries, so they still do have this like very, very moral repertoire on their little world. Like wash your hands and stuff. So if you you're in a tortoise and you do not wash your hands and stuff and do not clean it properly, then you're probably gonna become a tortoise because you know your body's gonna gonna get transformed because like you didn't have like a proper way of living and stuff. So I think it goes like both ways. So the thing for me was people people mention that like and people explain that kind of thing in terms of a kind of hype. 
So my so my point was, how can we take the idea of a Kahn seriously instead of like a pure pure native theory or like pure ethnographic description, but take it as a concept and as a concept which deformates and twists like an anthropological notion of a comparison, for example, as it said like as itself. The idea of the anthropological idea of comparing itself in transformation. And so I, I started like investigating and became interested in other usage of the idea of a Kahn. So I I realized that people use it for very different things, for transformation and for like this comparison between the past and the present, but also, for example, when people are looking at photographs and stuff they say it's a kind like the photograph and a person they are in the image and the person they are in an in an account relation uh, for example if you're walking on like on a path on the forest and the, when you come out the woods and the, the sun is high up and you see your shadows and people's shadows the shadows are also a kind related to the body so a, a kind uh, it, it it has this the similarity re relation, but also this this idea of one can occupy multiple states of living at once, and it's not a problem. So it's pretty much like an anti-representational concept and stuff, which therefore makes it the idea of of comparison we have. Like comparison, you have actually eliminate difference and stuff, so you can compare things. So my idea is like in a, in a symmetrical anthropology, how native theory, which like from, or an, ethnograph, or an ethnographic theory, how it deformates or twists our own conceptual repertoire as a social anthropology. Thank you. Shall we? Give it a call. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, Thank you. Despite the harsh virtual conditions, and uh, you know, we can look forward to a more, uh, you know, uh, real <laughs> conference in the future. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, it has been really stimulating and really interesting, despite, not despite, because of the diversity of the ethnographic uh, context. And uh, I think from the three of us, Luis, Javier and me, we would like to really thank you for, for being here, for presenting and for participating. And uh, that's it. Enjoy the rest of the Congress. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you all, guys. Okay, nice to meet you. All. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, very much. Nice stay. Yeah, stay safe. See ya. Bye bye. See ya. Bye. See you. Bye. <laughs>